let's dive in um, just to give everyone a little bit of background on why we're here and how this uh, webinar came to be. The New York City Compost Project and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has both been working on identifying best management practices specifically for community-scale composting and also through um, a newly formed Community Composting Coalition. Um, we, we bring you this DMP, this management practice webinar with a specific focus on successful rat prevention. We've got a bunch of exciting presenters that have a lot of experience in creating community compost systems that um, don't attract our four-legged friends. Um, and we'll kind of be diving into this by starting with Caroline and learning more about the life and habits of rats, and moving on to some site management tools with David. And with Linda, we'll, we'll finally touch base on other important considerations for your site. Uh, at the very end, uh, we'll have time for question and, and answers. And so if you have specific questions during this presentation, you can use the chat function and select to send a question to the, the organizers and panelists. And um, I'll be selecting the questions um, and posing them to the, to the panel. Um, so we have a full agenda, so I apologize in advance for interrupting um, the, the presenters, um, but um, we'll get tons of great information. And uh, one last note, actually, uh, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar to everyone that signed up. So if you have to sign up early, you can look forward to um, getting more information with the, the new um, once we send it out. All right. So with that, I'd love to introduce Carolyn Bradman. She is the Director of Neighborhood Interventions for the Pest Control Services Program at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Carolyn, take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, I have some slides, which I'm hoping will suddenly appear. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the biology and behavior of rats. And um, let's get started. So I just like to start my presentations with some um, information, some quick facts about rats. Um, I, as many gardeners may have noticed, um, reproductive peaks occur in spring and fall generally, um, which is why typically we start to get complaints about rats um, increasing in May, um, and then uh, you know uh, rat condi conditions can um, tend to continue. Um, to be severe throughout the summer. Um, now, in certain urban areas, especially where we have uh, like the um, a lot of warmth, we also might see um, constant breeding all year round. Um, gestation is relatively quick, about 22 days, and every litter can have eight to 12 um, pups. Um, one female rat, when well-fed and comfortable in her environment, can have up to seven litters um, in her lifetime. So even though a rat doesn't have a very long um, life, uh, uh, she can reproduce many times over, which is why typically we don't recommend that people just rely on, say, a predator um, for their rat control program. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, rats, um, the reason we are always concerned about community gardens and parks is, is because rats really their preferred habitat is nice, health, um, healthy soil. Um, so, you know, they like to build burrows in earthen spaces. Um, on top of that, they'll often choose to nest near a heat source, which could be your compost. Um, they also like to live near their food source. So that could also, um, in some situations, be compost. Um, also, rats are really creatures of habit. They travel the same paths over and over again, and those paths are always nest to food and food to nest. Let's go to the next slide. Um, typically, um, uh, 
um, feeding behavior of rats is between dusk and dawn. Um, and different rat colonies may have different behaviors. They know when the food comes out. So for example, on an urban block, if a restaurant puts their garbage out at 11 p.m., you might see rat feeding behavior at 11.30. So rats are kind of trained by um, the community about when they're going to come out and feed. But typically, they're going to feed over the evening hours. Um, in, in situations where you have a severe infestation, you might see the younger rats, the juveniles, or the weaker rats out um, foraging during the day um, because they would be more um, unsuccessful in the evening hours. They will also collect and store foods back in their nest, which is why if you look in a nest or you collapse a nest, you might find things like chicken bones or candy wrappers, um, uh, empty bags of chips, etc. Now, rats prefer to live within about 100 feet of their food source. So when we're on site inspecting a property, we're always looking for both the nest and the food source. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, um, I've been in a lot of situations where, um, you know, there's kind of, uh, in, in dense urban spaces, you have all different kinds of rat environments, and rats really take advantage of them all. So, they, as I said before, they prefer earthen burrows, um, but they will also go in paved areas beneath sidewalks is especially a big one. So, if you have a curbed area or some paved and some earthen space, they'll typically build their nests in the earth, earthen space space and then go right under the lip of the pavement and that kind of provides them with a natural roof. They'll go along building foundations both because they prefer to be up close to a building and because there might be some warmth there. Um, they love clutter. So um, again, when I'm looking for a site, my eye is going to um, be attracted to any areas where there's clutter and that can be gardening tools, equipment. Um, anything that goes undisturbed for more than a few weeks at a time. Typically, the entrance of a rat burrow will be two to three inches in diameter, and the depth of the burrow, the length, could be anywhere from about a foot to up to six feet, but more typically between one and three feet. Um, a burrow system will have one main entrance and then two or more bolt holes um, for safety for that rat um, colony. And there could be anywhere from one to 12 active rat burrows, active rats per burrow. Um, so what that means is, is when we're trying to get a baseline count of how many rats are in an area, we will count the burrow systems and then um, usually multiply that number by 10 because it's the easiest to get an estimate of, of how many rats may be using that space. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so here's a picture of typical rat burrows. This is exactly their kind of environment. So you have harbridge, um, dense planting that makes them feel safe. You have the um, burrows, um, the opening to the nest in the soil, but using the, the edge of the pavers as their natural roof. Go to the next slide. Um, here's another example. This is actually rats burrowing in a structure. Um, you can see how when a, um, a nest is well um, used, it gets almost shiny around the edge, um, and that's from the grease on the rat's fur from them going um, in and out. Now we can go to the next slide. Um, I always like to remind people that rats have incredibly um, powerful incisors. Their front teeth um, can get through just about any surface that they want to get through. Um, it, their, their teeth are almost as powerful as steel. So if, they, if there's a wooden structure um, that's um, holding food, they will typically gnaw right through that. Same thing with many different plastic bins. Now, any bin that is well sealed with a tight-fitting lid is going to be harder for them to get through but they're certainly going to try. So we like to remind people to look for the gnaw marks so you can see where rats are trying to access um, uh, whatever the structure is. And we can go to the next slide. Um, the other thing I like to remind people is that um, rats really like the way they themselves smell. And they use their urine, their droppings, and the pheromones on their fur to communicate with each other. This is really a reminder to people that no matter what 
kind of a situation you're in, you want to really clean frequently. So it's hard to clean soil, but if you have structures um, on site or if you even have a paved surface, if you're, work, if you're composting off of a paved surface, you want to be power washing and cleaning down, scrubbing down um, that surface regularly if rats are active in the area. And that will both protect the people that are using that site and it will reduce rat activity because rats are going to be continuously attracted to their own scent. Let's keep going. Um, the other thing I like to remind people is that rats will um, definitely eat anything that humans will eat and a whole lot more. Um, so rats um, typically um, can't survive or won't survive on just, say, um, vegetables um, that are being grown in a garden. Um, they, they need um, a, a nutritionally diverse diet, just like humans do. Um, so they need to find fat, they need to find carbs, they need to find um, uh, uh, you know, other things to supplement their, their diet. They also need water every day. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of times community gardens that aren't um, composting, um, they can, you know, reduce access to, um, to rats food um, by just containerizing garbage or not letting garbage in um, to the site. Once you introduce those other kinds of food sources, um, you're, you're, uh, it becomes more vulnerable and that's when you really have to manage and inspect that site um, more frequently. Let's keep going. Um, so this is just an illustration. Again, I mean, m most of what uh, rats are going for is human garbage when they're um, when they're out foraging for food, and they truly will eat just about anything. They only need an ounce of food and an ounce of water a day, which can be um, typically found, you know, in almost any um, public uh, litter basket um, or or even just on the ground. And let's keep going. Um, we also, when we're inspecting an area, we're looking for conditions that are highly conducive to rats. So I already um, mentioned um, clutter. Um, that's a really big factor in predicting whether rats are going to be in a site. So you always want to look around and see um, uh, you know, what unused spaces there are. Um, anything where you, the human, don't have a clear line of sight is going to be vulnerable to infestation. Um, rats like to feel safe. So um, also overgrown weeds and vegetation, things like um, w ivy, very um, uh, dense plantings will attract rats because they feel safe. Um, and then again, any kind of um, improperly contained waste or improperly managed waste. Um, you can look for structural holes um, with the same kind of criteria you look for the earthen burrow. So any hole or opening that is um, greater than the size of a quarter or you could use about an inch um, to determine if rats are able to access or use a site. And let's keep going. Um, so this is just an illustration of a rat burrow that's um, emerged in a pile of clutter. Um, this is why I find myself constantly reminding people to pull things up off the ground and inspect underneath. Um, rats truly take um, advantage of our own disorganization. And let's keep going. Um, here's an illustration of Harbridge. So um, rats actually have, um, uh, uh, they, they use um, the small hairs on the top of their head on the sides of their, so their whiskers, to um, uh, basically guide them to places where they feel safe burrowing. So they'll often seek out areas of dense harborage or planting and they'll, and they'll decide to nest there because they feel safe from predators. The way that you can solve that is if you're dealing with a rat infestation, you can start trimming up. Okay, let's keep going. Um, as I said before, they need um, a depth greater than, um, typically we say a foot, but it can be anything greater than eight inches to start building their earthen nests. So the other way to limit rats' access to a site is to build shallow planters. Um, that will limit their ability to burrow. 
and keep going. As I said before, um, ivy and dense planting that's close to the ground, anything that grows out um, uh, can make rats feel very safe. Instead, if you're dealing with a rat infestation, you can choose um, anything that's shaped in a more uh, conical way. Okay, great, almost there. Um, whenever you start to see mounding or visible kickback, that's a sign that you have fresh active burrowing. That's really a trigger to you to start to implement an active rat control or rat prevention program. And let's go on. Um, I already mentioned that you want to especially pay attention to that lip, that area where the soil meets the pavement and keep going. Okay, so finally, what are some things that you can do to prevent and respond to rats? First of all, during those seasons where rats um, start to increase, in the spring, for example, start to do regular inspections. Look for the signs of rat activity and start to monitor the park or the community composting space. Get rid of unused clutter and manage any storage areas by moving things around, power washing, scrubbing areas, paved areas down frequently. You can control weeds and other kinds of har harborage by trimming up um, or choosing different kinds of plantings. Always avoid dense planting. So keep a 10 inch clearance or 8 to 10 inch clearance, clearance under shrubs to maintain a line of sight and have a garbage plan. So if you have multiple people accessing a site, make sure that everyone understands how waste will be managed at that site. Look for um, structures that have leaks, cracks, or, or holes. You want to be looking for both water sources and food and harborage areas. Um, if you have um, uh, drains or other kinds of sewer pipes or openings that could be used by rats, you can um, start to seal those out with a uh, hardware cloth or other kinds of metal screening. And you can go to the next slide. Um, if you're building a structure um, for comp um, compost, we do recommend having like a buffer area. So you could have a two-foot clearance space between um, plants and, every, and any walls of a structure. Also, any walls of your neighbors. So you would want to really have a clean buffer um, between spaces. And that buffer would be an area that should be monitored frequently to make sure no rat activity is popping up. Um, you should continuously trim back um, any limbs, branches of plantings um, so that it's not touching your compost area or any nearby structures. And keep fence line perimeters especially clean and visible because so, you know those are going to be the most vulnerable areas. Also consider warmth as a vulnerable area. So you would want to build buffer areas around any um, structure, including the compost that would be generating warmth. Um, buffer areas can be created using either concrete or a landscaping gravel or, or construction gravel, or you can even use um, a pest proofing um, stainless steel mesh for exclusion. All right, and Caroline, I, gather. Wrap it up. That's it yeah. for me. Oh, perfect timing. All right. Yeah. And if you have questions with regards to things that Carolyn said, you can always shoot us a message and we'll get to that at the end. Next up, we have David Buckle, who is the compost site coordinator for the New York City Compost Project, hosted by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And the site that he oversees is located in Red Hook in Brooklyn. David? Thank, thanks, Renee. Um, I've got a few slides that are going to be coming up in just a second, too, if Nick's got those. And I'm going to have to talk really fast to uh, make sure we fill up uh, whatever we can here. Um, I thought I'd open by giving a little snapshot history at the site so you have a perspective on some of the things I'm going to be talking about. We started out with a nine-bin system uh, back when I started volunteering in 2009, and eventually we converted to an exclusive uh, windrow system. 
Um, we started out with out of control rats. They were running over the tops of our feet as we worked. We would pitchfork into a mound, pull out the pitchfork, and there'd be baby rats on the end of the tines. Um, now, uh, we have not spotted a rat on our site since November of 2011. Um, we started out with uh, odors that made people gag so much, the volunteers were staggering out the gate uh, to uh, controlled odors at the site, uh, usually limited to when we have a turn and we're starting to get a sense that the mound was uh, getting uh, a little bit anaerobic. Um, next slide, please. The photos um, I'm putting up are mostly to just give you a sense of our space and some of the, uh, the challenges to give, give you, once again, a perspective on the things that I'm talking about. Next slide. Uh, the next slide is going to be, this is what we call a seal. You can see the bright material is the fresh food mound that we built. The darker material is more mature compost. It's not finished compost, but it's compost that's no longer of interest to rats. And so we're sealing up the new mound with uh, that material to keep the rats out. What happens is if a rat scout comes over to see if we've got anything to offer, burrows in, by the time it gets through the one foot thick uh, layer that's sealing up the uh, fresh stuff, it hits the heat and it's repelled. Uh, next slide. This is a turn of a mound. Um, so to get right into the meat of this, uh, there are four questions we ask for controlling rats. Will you be, be able to deny rats access to a sense of security, access to your site, access to food, and access to habitat? Um, let's start with the first one. Will you be able to deny rats access to security? Next slide. This topic applies to all the other topics we'll be talking about, and it really comes down to uh, the rat's principal insecurity, which is being in an open space. Now, this is somewhat um, uh, repeating things that uh, Carolyn very appropriately raised about rats and their ways. Um, you can see in this photo that uh, we've got a lot of open space around the, uh, the mounds, and so if we had any scouts coming back to the site to see, hey, if things gone bad again, is this a good place for us, um, we're, a we're able to see them. Um, and so that's going to help uh, because we'll be screaming bloody murder and running after them. Um, but also they will, uh, in crossing these open spaces, have that sense of insecurity. So it's always important to force them out into a space like that uh, to make them feel like they're more vulnerable to predators like city cats, city hawks, or crazy humans. Um, the next question is, will you be able to deny rats uh, access to your site? Our site is surrounded by an open chain link fence, so we have no hope of that. We have to adopt a lot of other protocols like the spacing issue. At other sites that I've worked on, what we've done is to um, use lumber or hardware cloth or other means to block access along a fence or a gate or uh, whatever it may be that the rats will try to come through, and you force the rats to the narrowest access point. That way they're more insecure. Uh, discouraged, and if they're not discouraged, they're more susceptible to predators like humans, you know, wielding pitchforks and screaming bloody murder. Um, the next question, will you be able to deny rats access to food? In my mind, this has two features. Rats smell the food and they come looking, or rats actually get to the food. On smells attracting rats, the rule is no anaerobic inputs. By inputs, I mean the material, the organic material that's coming to your site. Um, there's uh, the condition of those inputs before they arrive, and you can work with your sources on that. So with a residential food scrap, you can talk to people about maybe putting their scraps in the freezer before they bring them to you, so when they arrive, they're not anaerobic. You can talk to them about pre-blending. This might be especially appropriate with your high volume sources. Um, you might provide them with wood shavings or sawdust or, or leaves, or just tell them that those are the sorts of things they should be looking for to pre-blend the material to decrease anaerobic activity. And lastly, lastly and most importantly, feel empowered and empower other com community composters to just say no. It's really hard because we're in the business of trying to keep organics local and uh, make uh, communities greener, uh, but sometimes you have to say no. In our case, it was our local church consistently bringing anaerobic inputs in sealed five-gallon buckets to the site. We worked with them on all the strategies, just didn't work out. In the end, the answer was no, that stuff can't come anymore. Then you've got the inputs after they arrive at your site. Um, you want to immediately get them uh, processed in some way. Again, you're going to work with sources on who does it and when. So, for example, at our site, we have a food co-op that brings uh, material that they cannot sell or donate. 
and what they do is uh, slice it, decontaminate, and then blend it with wood chips and put it into 45-gallon brute barrels. Wood chips at the base, the material goes in, wood chip cap, and then we put um, a little tent on top. Instead of using lids, we tent it up with stakes and a tarp, and that way there's a little bit of air circulation, and the material uh, won't be going anaerobic, and we'll be ready to just tip into a bin or a mound. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is an appropriate turning schedule. You would do this anyway because you want to make good compost, of course, but it relates to rack control. The biggest mistake I see here is assuming that the build is the end of the story. So many folks think that it's all about the build when at best that may be 10% of the work that's going to have to go into that mound when you take into account turning and sifting and everything else that has to be happening. Uh, lastly on this uh, leachate, uh, you're going to be figuring out your balance, your moisture management to try to um, limit or eliminate leachate altogether. You're going to have an impervial tarp ready for any heavy downpours because you want to keep your compost from getting too wet and causing leachate that will uh, create smells um, and other problems that you want to avoid as a composter. But in terms of rats, uh, you want to stop that smell. So you have something ready to smother if you do have leachate. That could be wood shavings. That could be sawdust. That could be leaves. Something you can smother it with, blend it up, and incorporate it into what we use uh, is a big barrel, 40, 44 uh, gallon barrel. Put wood chips in the base, put the smothered material in, wood chip cap once again, and then tent it up so that some air can get in there. Um, on the second piece of this, on rats getting past the smell and actually getting to the food, the biggest mistake I see is the roll away or the walk away. People are working on a bin or working on a mound, and material is rolling away, they're not keeping track of it or it's walking away on the tines of a pitchfork or the end of a shovel. And so you've got folks walking away with tools to lean it up against the fence, lean it up against the wheelbarrow, and a lot of debris is coming off. Um, you've got to either watch for that sort of stuff and try to limit it so people are leaning on tools only in a certain place that can be swept up later, or you just recognize it's going to happen and you sweep very, very diligently. Uh, and that has to be built into your turning schedules, your build schedule and your turning schedule. The biggest mistake I see is not including the time to actually do a very thorough uh, sweep. Uh, next slide. Your choice of compost systems will also come into play here. Uh, tumblers can be the most rodent-proof and easy to use. They turn fast. There's no sweeping. You roll a wheelbarrow underneath or a rag, uh, wagon with a, um, a mixing pan underneath, tip it out, and off you go to your build or your bin. Um, the big mistake I see is overloading. Folks don't know how to use their tumblers well. You overload it, you can't get the material out. And it's not also not going to be um, developing well in the uh, tumbler. So you have to monitor that. Another big mistake is judging tumblers by the manufacturer who claim that you're going to have finished compost in six weeks. Don't believe it. I've got tumblers at home. I've had them at work for over a decade. Um, it doesn't happen. You have to view tumblers, in my mind, as transitional devices. They're essentially there for you to, as temporary storage for material until you're ready to put it into a bin or a mound. Or if you want to um, potentially get the material to the point where it's no longer of interest to a rat. It may not be finished. In fact, it won't be finished. But you can at least tumble it to the point where it's no longer of interest, and then you can tip it out into a bin or a mound um, and then worry less about rats. Um, keep in mind scale. If you have a lot of material going in, you may have to have multiple tumblers because you might have to stop feeding one so that it can get to the point you want it to get to and then feed another or a third or maybe even a fourth. Other compost systems, boxes and bins, uh, the big mistake I see here is cost of modifications and extra tools. For example, if you look at the Garden Gourmet, if you're going to rat proof that, you've got to put hardware cloth on the base. If you're going to turn it without like tipping it all out and turning it by shovel back into the bin, you're going to have to have an auger. By the time you buy stuff and do stuff, you may have spent the money and the time you would have spent on a tumbler, so keep that in mind. Another big mistake is realizing that hardware cloth is not enough. If you've got the type of bin that's wrapped just in hardware cloth, um, as Caroline picked, uh, mentioned, rats uh, will get through uh, steel. Um, I have seen a freshly hardware cloth bin get, in claw got clawed through in just one night. Um, now, admittedly, New York City has professional rats. They're going to get it done sooner, but rats are capable of this. So if, if, if it's a bin system, what we did in the past is as we built in the bin, we would line the perimeter with browns or uh, more developed compost. So we might build up 
6 to 12 inches. Um, and then the next 6 to 12, we would do a wrap around the edge of that material, and then we would build up with the, the fresh material. Uh, another mistake, putting these compost systems near walls, fences, next to debris. As I said, in New York City, it only takes one night for rats to figure out how to get in. This is why often we'll uh, uh, recommend to community gardens that they put their compost systems in the center of the garden, away from everything. Force those rats out into the open. Make them feel insecure. Make them feel like they're subject to predators. Um, and even if they're not discouraged, make them exposed to you so you can uh, manage them better. With windrow, wind, windrows, uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier, um, you have to leave time to sweep up all the rat food into the mound and then cover it up with a one-foot foot thick layer of compost old enough not to be interested in rats. Um, and that leads us to our last question. Will you be able to deny rats access to habitat? The tumblers excel. They're sealed and they're lifted off the ground. It looks like we might have lost David. Um, we're just about to wrap up anyway very close so we'll jump into Linda's presentation and um, if we have other questions related to David's talk we can get him on at the at the end. Um, so with that I'll introduce Linda who is at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and she'll be diving into details for other considerations in our composting processes. Thanks for joining us today. Carolyn and David have already covered a lot of very useful tips and considerations for your compost site management plans. I'm going to take the next few minutes to tie things back to our most essential composting labor force, the composting process, and the microbes that drive it. I'll also touch on some unique considerations for working with bin systems. Even when managing for rest, the composting process must be the priority. In order to avoid potential problems with odors, pests, etc., the composting process has to drive our management and site plans not the other way around. This requires us to fully understand the process, evaluate our options, and be realistic about our limitations. To start, let's do a quick review of the composting process. This is your average aerobic compost pile's temperature curve. Our compost starts in mesophilic conditions, then the thermophilic as active composting phase kicks in, and then back to mesophilic conditions until the curing phase is complete. The active phase can be expected to last six to eight weeks, while curing can last another two to even four months. There is only so much that we can do to speed up this time frame, and that can only be done through more active management, like regular turning, watering, and monitoring. For any project composting large amounts of food scraps and using that compost to grow more food, we strongly recommend following the process to further reduce pathogens, or PFRP. This requires our pilots hitting at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit for a few days, but the specific time frames will depend on the system type you're using. These temps will also make your compost less hospitable to potential pests like rats. A pile that provides these optimal conditions will compost most quickly and efficiently and be easier to manage in the long run. A compost mix that has the right C to N ratio, enough water, the right bulk density, and is thoroughly mixed, well-shaped, and piled big enough should have no trouble hitting PFRP temps and will also help to minimize odors. In addition, every step of the composting process from storing browns to storing finished compost needs to be enclosed in some way to keep animals from becoming an issue. This is particularly true for raw food scraps and actively composting piles. As David described earlier, covering active piles with biofilters is definitely a BMP. For additional protection, bin systems can work well and are often ideal for purely volunteer-run projects, but they do require some unique considerations, particularly for keeping rats at bay. For one, you want to minimize corners available for rats to chew on, and you want no gaps that they could squeeze through. Keep in mind that a half-inch gap is big enough for a rat to squeeze through, while a quarter-inch is big enough for mice. If you're building bins from wood, it's ideal to build when the lumber still has moisture in it. If you have to store the lumber, it should be stacked in a way that will minimize warping. You should, build bin, you should build and install your bins on a level surface to keep your system square and minimize the potential for gaps to form over time. Your system should ideally be built on gravel or a concrete pad. Bins built on the bare ground will require extra precaution and monitoring. The system should be off the ground to make it harder for rats to burrow and hide under it, and mixing of raw composting materials should happen on a surface 
surface that can be easily cleaned, such as tarps or mixing bins. We don't want to leave any food residuals or smells on the ground around our system, as this is an open invitation for rats to come check things out. A quick shout out to DC. Pictured is the most popular composting system in the DC area. It's a rat resistant design by Urban Farm Plans. The design was commissioned by the DC Department of Parks and Rec for use in a fantastic compost cooperative network. The compost knox is a modular cube system, and each cube is enclosed in half inch hardware cloth on four of its six sides with the addition of spaced concrete pavers on the floor of each cube for extra protection from rats. This great design is available for download on Urban Farm Plans' website, and check out DCDPR's website for more information on their compost cooperative network. Back to the composting process. Curing is a critical and often overlooked step. If mismanaged, not only can immature compost end up doing more harm than good in our gardens, this phase can be another point of attraction for rats. Here are some key points for curing. Compost is not ready for curing as long as visible food scraps are present. Sifting should only happen after curing, as fungi are key to this part of the process and sifting disrupts their hyphae. As with other stages of composting, piles of both curing and finished compost need to be protected. Even though there should be no more food left in our compost at this point, during curing, temperatures are still above ambient, which can be attractive to rats. We don't want burrowing rats or other animals contaminating the high quality compost we've worked so hard to create. The concept for the hardware cloth corral pictured originally came from the DC Compost Cooperative Network. A colleague at the Howard University site, Jeffrey Neal, then added gravel and paver stones underneath to increase rat resistance. For compost site management, monitoring is key. This involves checking your compost regularly and recording your observations. Odors, temperatures, and moisture content should guide your compost management schedules. This is also a good time for checking for rat activity. Checking these conditions regularly will help keep things moving smoothly and keep you, help you stay on top of any potential rat pressure. In addition, keeping records helps you figure out what went wrong, remember what went well, and communicate with your team about how things are cooking. Then having made observations, you need to act on them. Basically, you don't want to let small problems become big ones. For example, you should fix holes in bins immediately and take action if there's any evidence of rat activity. If rat pressure becomes a big problem, you may need to stop accepting material or arrange to have it taken somewhere else for a time until you get a handle, get a handle on things. As David mentioned earlier, you may even need to cut off unresponsive compost project participants if, even after asking them to correct their behavior, they continue bringing troubles to materials or are somehow not fulfilling their responsibilities. To be able to fix problems as soon as possible, make sure people can get a hold of you when they need to. It can't be overstated that proper training for anyone participating in your composting project is critical. Of course, this is especially true for anyone involved in management. Participants need to know what they're doing and need to be held accountable for their responsibilities. This involves providing clear directions via informational signage and regular communications among your team, perhaps via shared documents or weekly meetings. Another key to compost management success already mentioned is site hygiene. This involves rinsing tools that came into contact with raw food scraps or active compost and controlling where this rinse water ends up. It's ideal to use this water to water new active piles if possible. If something has gone wrong and you see rat activity in a pile that has passed through the thermophilic phase, we strongly recommend recomposting any contaminated piles by following the PFRP guidelines mentioned earlier. Solarizing is another option, but this will unfortunately kill off all of the biology in the pile, even the good stuff. As a compost site manager, there are a couple of key questions you need to be able to answer. First, what schedule can your dependable labor force handle? Dependable is a keyword. Basically, who do you know will show up to your work days? Active compost piles that have lots of putrescible materials, like hundreds of pounds of food scraps in them, for example, are ideally turned weekly, but at the very least monthly. You need to keep participants from getting burnt out or overcommitted, and that includes yourself. So don't accept more material than you know you and your team can manage. The next question is, what amount can your system handle? Too much material can create scenarios where rats have access to either habitat, like if you have too many browns piled up, or food, like if you have exposed or unprotected food scraps sitting around. Staying on top of the flow of materials onto and off of your site is critically important. 
So some closing thoughts for setting yourself up for success and avoiding potential problems include your compost piles and your microbial allies have predictable needs. So how will you meet them? Think through the whole process and make space for all of the stages and components of composting. Think big, but start small and simple. And most importantly, be realistic about what you can manage. It's also important to adopt best management practices for your site and require adherence from your program participants. On ILSR's website landing page for this webinar is a draft set of BMPs for community composting. In the coming months, ILSR will be working with other community composters from around the country to review and refine these. We also welcome your feedback. So check out our website for other resources on this topic. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, everyone. Um, we have David back on the line, and um, we're going to go into the questions and answers. And one question I'm going to shoot to him first is kind of talking more about the materials in the composting construction and what are other good um, materials to keep in mind when uh, building a bin to make it uh, uh, not Showing accessible this. for that. So the question, the question is, uh, what materials to keep in mind for building a bin for the purpose of a rack control? Have I got that right? Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay, great. Um, I'm glad to be back, and I, I think we should say we were remiss uh, in not pointing out one unique feature of rats. They may be nearsighted, but they are extremely intelligent and obviously have the capacity to hack into a webinar when they know they're in deep trouble. So we should all take this as a compliment. Um, that we've been hacked in Good and our point. links messed with and our slides messed with. Uh, so to answer the question, I do think um, the finer the hardware cloth you can get, the better. We started out with um, uh, half inch to an inch hardware cloth and found it gave the rats more leverage in terms of using their teeth and their claws. So we dropped down to a quarter inch. Um, even then, you still have to observe uh, other uh, protocols. So, for example, the hardware cloth has to cover all six sides, including top and bottom. Um, and uh, you, know, you have to take into account placement, get it away from walls, debris, uh, other things like that, and make sure that there's nothing underneath that will create a habitat, even if they can't get at the food. Um, so, I think that's probably what I'd say about that. Thanks, David. Another question um, that everyone kind of brought up is food. Rats are looking for food, but they're also looking for shelter. Is there one characteristic, food versus shelter, that's more important to rats? And that can be maybe for Caroline or David to jump in. Uh. Well, this is David. I'll jump in quickly. Thanks, David. Yeah, I'd say they're both uh, equally important. If they're saying, if by shelter, what is meant by uh, is, is habitat, um, because you can have rats uh, even after you've denied them access to food because you're providing warmth or cover for them to uh, develop uh, a habitat. So um, they both, you have to pay attention to both. I, I, I don't think it's possible to win, and you can win, but you can't win without addressing uh, both of those issues. Um, and then quickly, I, I think part, when I got, when the rats hacked in and cut me off, um, the one piece I didn't get a chance to talk about, I believe, is long-term storage. Um, bagged or fenced in leaves, I, we found our particular interest because they hold a burrow in a way that something like wood chips usually do not. And so the classic example was some of, a lot of us have in the past stored leaves in chain link silos. Um, and that, that's fine if, if that's where you go, but you're going to have to place them on the site in a way that you can monitor all the way around the silo to see if there's any burrow formation and then you have a long handle tool to get in there and disrupt uh, the burrow. Um, and it, disruption is really the goal in terms of the habitat formation, moving things all over the site periodically for some kind of schedule or strategic placement of the storage units like that um, chain link silo. Um, and another way we've gone is we're converting extensively to um, 
brute barrels, 44 gallon barrels, which are rodent, rodent proof, waterproof, um, and because they don't have to sit up on pallets or otherwise be part of some other structure, uh, they're, allow, they're allowing us to gradually eliminate all other sources of habitat formation at the site. Next question. Another habitat question um, from the audience. Using compost covers, it sounds like they're good for keeping in moisture, but that by using a compost cover, could you be creating a, a rat prone environment? Uh, yes. The answer is definitely yes. The question was by using a compost cover, can you uh, actually create a habitat uh, even if you've denied access to food? And the answer is yes. But um, if you've observed all the other protocols for getting rid of the rats and then keeping them off your site because there's nothing of interest there, uh, then uh, using the compost cover is not an issue. And for the purpose of creating quality compost is rather important in a lot of instances. We still use uh, a variety of covers at our site, um, but it was after we got rid of the rats. Um. Next. Question for Caroline. Um, with people using more green infrastructure and, and pushes for, for having more permeable surfaces and less concrete, do you anticipate that this would create additional habitat for that nesting? So we may have lost Caroline. We might have lost Caroline. So yeah, Linda or, or David, do you have any thoughts on green infrastructure and how it might create more rat habitat? And what kind of structure did you specify? It's just kind of green, green infrastructure. Um, I guess it's creating more permeable surfaces. And if you're if we have softer ground that rats could burrow in, um, I think that's what the audience member was getting at. Yeah, I'm not so clear on exactly what those structures m might be, but um, I think it gets back to Caroline's presentation in terms of watching for what's going to allow for a good roof uh, for a burrow, especially if it's next to um, other kinds of cover like um, ivy and weeds and things that allow rats not to be spotted and allows them to feel secure and not exposed. Um, whether or not there are predators, uh, cats, city hawks, or humans, if rats just feel insecure to begin with, you've won a significant part of the war uh, just because they, they feel discouraged and they'd rather be somewhere else. Next. Yeah, um, so we've got a couple questions on ingredients and um, dealing with anaerobic food scraps. One question related to Bokashi. Could Bokashi potentially deal with the negative effects of anaerobic food scraps? Um, and then a question, maybe more clarification, are rats attracted um, to anaerobic input? Uh, well, Bokashi is a very different uh, type of composting. Uh, we need lots of different types of composting, and that's an important approach. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, in the residential context, it usually refers to a bin that you'll maintain in, in the kitchen uh, uh, with beneficial microbes, and you'll add the material and you'll seal it with a lid. Um, and so it's, a very, it's just a very different system than um, most community-based compost sites. Uh, so it, it's a, it, would, it would require a very different approach. Uh, this is Linda, and I would say I've seen Bakashi being used successfully sort of as a pretreatment um, before uh, hot composting. Um, so it's a, it can be a useful storage technique for food scraps um, if, if it's going to be a while before you can get it to a composting site for some reason. Um, but it also depends on how well you um, you've managed your bokashi. So if the bokashi is working like it's supposed to, it can be a good way to kind of put your food scraps in like a stasis and sort of a holding pattern. Um, but my feeling still is that it's going to be ideal to put that into a hot composting. Um, but I, I think the second part of the question was whether anaerobic conditions attract or attract, uh, attract rats. And 
I would say that it's basically the smells that will potentially attract rats. So um, anaerobic conditions is where a lot of our smells, uh, bad smells come from. So if you're manager, managing oxygen levels in your compost appropriately, you should be keeping the smell down, smells to a minimum um, and therefore ideally keeping animals from being attracted. Yeah, in my mind, uh, anaerobic conditions and the aroma that comes with them is a signal to, to rats that a site is likely to be of interest. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily the case, but uh, it's a signal that there may be some exposed food or raw food that's available for them. So Caroline's back on, and I have a question that is for her, kind of related to um, other types of ways to, to deter rats, like using odors, smelly plants like mint people have used. Um, are there non-toxic um, methods that you can use to deter rats from taking over an area? That is an excellent question. I'm glad to be unmuted. Um, so a lot of people are interested in whether or not there are known repellents for rats, and at this time there are no known repellents, which means that there are there are no repellents that have been rigor, rigorously studied um, in real life situations. There are um, companies that market materials such as mint as um, rat repellent. Um, but we have no consistent evidence that they actually work um, in real life. And what that means is, you know, for us, the reality is rats are among the most successful mammals on Earth. And if a minty smell were gonna, um, was going to work as a rat, rat repellent, we would surely know it by now. Um, so I, I think that the, the, the mint smells um, at, um, as rat repellents um, is, is largely a myth. It, it really can sometimes hurt us because people will use mint and then kind of just hope for the best. Um, I, I usually recommend that people do the reverse. So um, we, we unfortunately don't know of any repellents, but we do know that rats are attracted to the way rats smell, and they're also um, attracted to the way food smells. So if you try to control um, odors around food, and if you vigorously clean um, areas that have been exposed to rats, to reduce the rat smell, um, then you're going a long way um, uh, towards rat prevention. And, and really that's because rats are neophobic, so they're, they're afraid of new things. Um, so you want to remove what makes them feel comfortable and replace it with something that, it, um, that, that is foreign to them. Renee, often the next... Don't... Yes, please. I was just going to say, you ask often that the question? next question people go to is uh, the use of traps. Like if they, if they can't oh, yeah. use mint or something like that, the next question is often traps. And our experience has been that traps do not work if you otherwise haven't observed all these protocols for especially denying access to food. Um, because if there's other food available at the site, the traps are just not going to be effective. And so it, it's important to stay focused on prevention um, to try to keep get the rats off the site and keep them off. Um, and then if you succeed there, then the traps are unnecessary. Great. One last question kind of related to this. Um, if you don't have access to water or a power washer, are there any alternatives for the sites that are much smaller in scale um, that things that they could do to clean? Um, we often in the winter will have our hoses uh, inaccessible because they're frozen. And so uh, our cleaning practices then usually involve using uh, wood shavings, sometimes wood chips, to uh, scour out bins or buckets. Um, and we do that right into a bin or into a mound. Um, and that's usually, uh, usually adequate given, you know, if you, if you get really good at that. So um, it's pretty thorough and it takes care of the issue. I have one last question. I know it's a little after four, but just to, for all three of the panelists, it's a question on for folks that are starting community composting projects, what are like the first steps you should do? Should you reach out to your local rat abatement 
staffer, um, who are the resources that you should solicit in your communities um, in keeping that out of your comfort zone. I'll jump in real quick just to say, um, I, if the rats uh, had not been overly successful in their hacking, uh, we're going to have some resources posted on the webinar page. So that'll be uh, one beginning in terms of just having a lot more detail to back up what you've been hearing from the panelists. Um, and then beyond that, because I'm sure my co-panelists will have things to say as well, I'll just mention that it's always important to start small. Uh, I think the biggest mistake I've seen over the years is, is people over plan and go large beyond their capacity to have effective turning schedules. And so much better to start small, make sure you got it down with the smallest scale, and then build out as you can. Yeah, I would, uh, this is Linda, I would agree with what David just said. Uh, the resources on our, on ILSR's sort of landing page for this webinar will have a lot of resources, um, including um, the BMP guide that I mentioned, which does kind of have a beginning to end uh, list of things to consider. Um, and I would also second that starting small uh, is the best way to go. Uh, you can dream big, but definitely start small and uh, build the right relationships with, you know, the person or entity that owns the land that you might be composting on. You have to have a good relationship with them. You have to follow whatever rules they might um, put on you. Um, and so I think being proactive and engaging the community that surrounds the site too are key considerations. And then, uh, you know, developing relationships with the folks that are going to be giving you the feedstocks that you're going to be composting, uh, whether it's food scraps or garden waste or anything like that. You're going to need people to help you out, and then you do need your, your team that's going to help you manage the compost because it's not just building a pile and letting it sit, depending on what you've put into it. If you've put a lot of food scraps into something, you're going you're gonna to definitely need to uh, manage that pile. So. Uh, it's kind of thinking through things ahead of time and then experimenting within reason. So, all right, Caroline, any last comments? Well, if for those that are still on the line, we have a few last polling questions that we'd love to pose um, just to get your feedback. Um, so if we can have pull up the first polling question to wrap this up. After the webinar, do you feel that composting can be managed to deter that? We've got a lot of yeses and maybe. 93% yeses. Great. So if you learned something. All right, next question. And there's our results. What should our next community composting webinar topic be? This is our first one, and we're looking forward to doing this on a somewhat regular basis. And we're just looking for other folks' uh, input on what they're interested in learning more about. And for those who don't know, BMP is Best Management Practice. Thanks, Katie. And it looks like a lot of people are doing more, more composting BMPs also interested in business models. These are the two big areas. All right, next polling question, our last one. Here's a quick snap of our results. And most important, how did you hear about it? Um, there are a lot of outreach going on around this event. Um, we'd love to share how you heard about it. And for those questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, you can feel free to reach out to us um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you're interested in getting more information from David, Caroline, Linda, or myself. And it looks like most people, about 25%, heard it from the Cultivating Community Composting Outreach. Um, also, the New York City Compost Project Outreach and some other resources as well. Look at that.
And if you selected other, we'd love to hear those other resources just so that we can tap into those in future outreach methods. If you wouldn't mind shooting us an email if you chose other, we'd love to know that. What email should they use? Um, the, the ILSR registration. Nick, if you want to jump in, I don't want to give out your email address, but info at ILSR.org. Info at ILSR.org. Great. With that, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, we look forward to doing another webinar and we'll do one next time. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.